Right, so we are carrying on with our introduction to nutrient content claims in Canada. And in our previous video, we talked about the different types of claims that can be occurring. So nutrient content claims, method of production claims, origin claims, health claims, all of these have different elements to them. And we're going to go bit by bit into each of these different types of claims and think about what's needed from us as product developers to be able to substantiate these claims. So at the end of this video, you'll be able to describe how nutrient content claims are defined using the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry. Our favorite book will use the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry to source up-to-date information to validate the claims. We'll understand the burden of evidence required to maintain the claims, and we'll apply the appropriate wording from the nutrient content claims tables to create a compliant claim. And what on earth does this mean? Well, we'll dig in in a minute, but you just can't go out there and willy-nilly say whatever you want about your food product. And if you have a nutrient content claim, you can't just go out and phrase it in any random way. You have to be very, very particular about the wording and the structure. Health Canada and the CFIA have provided guidance on exactly how you can and can't phrase things. So... We've seen these slides before, but just a quick reminder, of, you can read it yourself, but you have to be really careful. You can't go out on food products in Canada and make any sort of statement that makes an impression that you are uh, curing a disease with any sort of food product. You also can't provide any information that is false or misleading. You have to be absolutely clear about the character and composition of this food product. And we are going to consistently be referring to the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry because, again, in many of the regulatory principles that we discuss in this class, the potential of it changing is extremely high. And so by getting into the habit of going back to the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry, you know that you are always going to be going back and researching the most authenticated and up-to-date source and that you're looking for information from the government and the government's own resources, not just random things that you're finding in Google. That said, you can go and Google the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry to get you started. Now, I put this slide up because it just gives a sense of the whole myriad of different health claims. It's, I realize it's an American slide, but uh, I just wanted to bring up the fact that so many uh, food products with a nutrition-oriented uh, demographic in mind or a nutrition sort of uh, focus in terms of the unique selling prop proposition, so many of them are going to use some sort of label claim. And we need to be really cognizant of how to do this because, again, product developers are often um, in the space between marketing and R&D and production and all sorts of different uh, all sorts of different scenarios are going to put pressure on you to be able to justify the sorts of claims that are on a different product. Often it is, there's push and pull when it comes to developing in that product and who is defining who needs or what sort of claims you need to be making on that product. Oftentimes it'll be marketing and they'll come out there and they'll say it's really important to our consumers that we have a good source of vitamin vitamin A on our label. So you product developer, you need to make sure that whatever product you come up with, it has that good source of vitamin A. In other cases, you might have come up with a great recipe and you will see that you've got the potential of using a variety of different claims within your, within your optimized formulation. Take a, take a, a long look at the sort of push pull dynamics that are occurring in making claims. So again, nutrient content claims are they're, they're synergistic with the nutrition facts table. I should have said nutrition, not nutrient facts table, nutrition facts table. And it really goes back to what's there and what's not there. You have to think about the different nutrients that are on that nutrition facts table, that some of them are um, positive nutrients, ones that you want to increase in, in uh, the amount in that food product by reference size, and other nutrients that are on there are ones that you want to reduce 
in content because um, they're potentially negative within our diet. Things like uh, saturated fat, trans fat, sodium. These are nutrients that we want to be thinking about reducing. And, and so you've got to be deliberate about that. You do have to follow the prescribed wording and it will make sense as soon as we jump out to the table. You have to meet the content requirements and you have to, if, if it's a voluntary nutrient, one that's not found in a standard nutrition facts table, you have to prompt the labeling of it in the nutrition facts table. I have a second video where we talk about how to do that in Nesha. Now, I know that protein is an important nutrient right now and a lot of uh, food companies want to be able to make protein claims. Protein doesn't follow the same rules and I've, I've got a video. It's a little bit old, but um, in general, the content's absolutely bang on, except for the fact that I mentioned the Schedule M and Schedule K of the Food and Drugs Regulation. And, and now we're using the, the uh, tables of reference serving sizes. And, but the rest of it, the, the calculation of protein efficiency is still the same. It's still the 1981 method. Um, and so do take, a, do take a look at that video as well. Let's just jump in and use some examples. And it, I admit it's, it's after midnight and I just cut and paste some pictures of example food products so that we can walk through this at this point. But uh, here we go. We've got some potato chips. It's 50% less sodium than Lay's uh, classic potato chips. And we've got 160 milligrams of sodium per 50 gram serving. So let's just do some quick, um, pardon me, but we're going to do some quick research here. What is a, uh, so we've got the table of reference amounts for food. Let's find chips in here. What is a reference amount for chips? So I did control F and I typed in chips and chips is a reference serving size of 50 grams. So that should be the standard serving size on a multi-portion package. Now let's jump back. Actually, let's jump straight actually to the guide to food labeling for industry. So food labeling for industry, if you remember, we're going to scroll down to the table of contents claims and statements. Oh, and there's our nutrient content tab down here. And when we're in the nutrient content claims, I've already talked briefly about some of those key functions about um, when you need to make a claim and when you need to trigger a claim and what if you've triggered that claim, what, what additional things do you need to do? So sodium, as we know, is a standard nutrient on every nutrition facts table. So we don't have to do any new triggering. Potato chips must have a nutrition facts table and so it's not like it was exempt from having a nutrition facts table but because we made a claim now it must have a nutrition facts table. Let's jump into sodium here. Sodium and what I really want to do is scroll down to this table. So summary table for sodium salt claims. So free from sodium I have to have less than five milligrams per reference amount in serving of stated size. So as we noted before, that was 50 grams. Now you could have a single serve package that is a different reference amount and serving of stated size. So the reference amount may say it's 50 grams, but your package of potato chips may hold 60 grams of potato chips because it's a single serving package. And so it has to be less than five grams on both of them. And that and word there is important. Now we can go back to this column one here, and this is what you can say that it's free of sodium, sodium free, no sodium, zero sodium, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are the only ways you can word it. Everything that's in column one, that's, that's the only way you can state it. And the other piece of the puzzle is of course, if um, your food is exempt, now you are going to uh, prompt the need for a nutrition facts table. And so let's say you are, uh, trying to put a sodium free claim on apples. Apples normally would not have a nutrition facts table, but because you're saying sodium free, now your apples have to have a nutrition facts table. And this is the reference from the Food and Drugs Regulation where the actual clause is for the law that states exactly this. Now let's jump back low in sodium. Can we say this? Well, uh, we had 160 milligrams of sodium per reference amount and serving of stated size. So no, we are higher than this. If we were below, we could say low in sodium or little sodium or any one of these things in the left-hand column. And those conditions from before are the same. 
How about it was reduced in sodium? No, it wasn't reduced in sodium. It was lower in sodium as compared to. So in this case, to say reduced in sodium or any of these things in the left-hand column, your food has to be processed so that it has at least 25% less sodium per reference amount of the food or a similar reference food per 100 gram or per 100 grams of a similar reference food in prepackaged meal format. And it does not meet the conditions set out in column two for low in sodium. So you can see why a lot of people balk at the idea of having health claims on their food products because suddenly it becomes extremely complex. Can we say it's lower in sodium? I believe that was the actual claim. So the food contains at least 25% less sodium per reference amount of food, a food uh, of a reference food of the same food group. Let's see. Let's jump back to our slideshow here. And I tell you because I've actually planned it this way. So we've got 50 grams and 160 milligrams per 50 grams. And oh, wait a second. I found you the classic Lay's. And actually, this is the photo of this package is not the same. Because, as you'll note, this is a single-serve package, and the uh, serving of stated amount is not the same as the reference serving. The reference serving was 50 grams, and the serving of stated amount is 66 in this case. So don't look at that uh, value there, please. Um, we're going to work with this nutrition facts table. So was it, the, re the requirement was it was 25% less. So let's bring up a calculator here. And so, is it 25% less? Oh, come on, calculator. So that was 160 times 1.25, 200. So the reference of serving, ah, come on. We know the number is 200. So is 200 less than 330? Yes, it is. We know that this is, so, it is going to be within that, is it? Is it within that 25% less or more, um, greater than 20% reduction of the sodium based off of the baseline formulation? Absolutely. So you are well within your right on this product to say it is reduced in sodium. So go back, 50% less sodium. Was it 50%? That would be 160 times 2 is 320. It is, it is, it actually does comply with that 50% less because it would have to be 320 milligrams. So there's one example. The wording of this from a comparative claim perspective. You know what? I wonder if that actually is compliant. Because it's you can say reduced in sodium, but can you say 50% less sodium? Hmm. Is that a comparative claim? Oh, let's actually nutrient content claim is a comparative claim. Let's jump out there and see the comparative claims. Condition for comparative claims. So it is a legitimate example of a comparative claim would be 33% less sodium per serving than our regular potato chips. And so in this case, it is a legitimate comparative claim. You, you see how it, it gets to be a bit of a headache going back and forth and back and forth, but you have to go to that level of detail. Let's jump out to this one example. So we've got bran flakes. High source of fiber, it says on the box, low in fat, and 24 grams of whole grains per 30 grams. That's a method of production quality claim, and we'll deal with that at a later point. And so our reference serving size is 30 grams. High source of fiber, let's do that one first. It's 5 grams, or 20% of the daily value. So let's just jump out to our guide to food labeling for industry and do fiber. So that was five grams. Let's find fiber here. Energy and calories, protein, fat, saturated fat, trans fat, etc., etc. Where's dietary fiber? That's why I can't find fiber. 
So five resources, in some cases, you do need to make a structure function claim and indicate exactly what the fiber source is. So is it a source of fiber? Source of fiber contains fiber, provides fiber, made with fiber. That is the wording that you can say. It has to have two grams or more per reference amount and serving of the stated size. And if it's a specified source of fiber, so let's say we wanted to say oak bran, you would have to specify the fiber source in the ingredient statement or claim. Is it a high source of fiber? Four grams or more? Yes. Is it a very source, a very high source of fiber? Six grams or more? No. So let's jump back to our box of cereal here. It is a high source of fiber at five grams of fiber. And that claim is compliant. How about low fat? Low fat, in this case, we've got 0.5 grams per serving at serving of stated size 30 grams. So let's jump back to our nutrient content claims for fat. Is it low fat? So free of fat is less than 0.5 grams. Low fat is three grams or less when the reference amount is 30 grams or 30 mils or less, or three grams of fat per 100 grams and 30% less of the energy from fat. So is it low fat? That was three grams or less? It is indeed three grams or less. We will not deal with the whole grains claim right now. Let's do one more just for fun. So no artificial preservative flavors or colors. Those are method of production and quality claims. And so we'll deal with that in a later point. 80% less saturated fat than butter. So we had one of those comparative claims. And so what you'd have to do is get the nutrition facts table for butter from Esha or from a competitor's package and be able to make that substantiated claim between the quantity of saturated fat in this base cell buttery margarine as compared to the other. How about trans fat? Zero trans fat, trans fat. Let's look on the list here. Trans fat is zero. Let's do that one just for fun. Nutrient content claim. Trans fatty acid claims. Let's find the free of zero trans fat. So it has to contain less than point, uh, 0 0.2 grams of trans fatty acid per reference amount and serving of the stated size. Or serving of stated size if it's a prepackaged meal and it has to meet also, the, uh, the requirements in column two for low and saturated fatty acids for saturated fatty acid claims. So we have to go to the saturated fatty acid claim and we have to also meet the less than 0.2 grams of saturated fatty acids. This one's interesting. So let's jump back there. How much saturated? Uh, so one gram of saturated fat. Oh, gee whiz, where are we? So we've got, let's go back there. The trans fat, it has to meet the conditions set out in column two for low in saturated fatty acids. So we had one gram. Oh, no, you know what? It's not free of saturated fat, low in saturated fatty acids. So we had one gram of saturated fatty acids, and the, the column two low in saturated fatty acids claim is less than two grams. So that is compliant. You see how you almost are going on this wild goose chase, chasing after multiple leads at the same time to be able to make this sort of claim? It's, it's a little bit like a scavenger hunt. How about non-hydrogen? Non-hydrogenate is a statement of production. And so method of production claim is where you're at. And as long as it's factual and uh, truthful, then it's okay to say that. Do double check and make sure that there's any sort of claim related. But no trans fat and low and saturated fat. We were able to do the low and saturated fatty acids. Yes, indeed. So we can make that statement. 
So let's just jump back. You have had the chance now to see how you have to parse through this numerous times. Anytime you want to make a claim, you've got to go and double check exactly what is on your nutrition facts table. And in some cases, you've got to follow multiple trails, almost like a detective, to figure out all of the requirements to be able to make that statement of claim. And so it's eminently doable. I think all of you are absolutely clever enough to be able to do this is the patience and the perseverance that you don't just take a look at the first level that's there and stop. You have to, you have to push through and make sure you've read the entire table. I realize for the purpose of this video, I'm scrolling through really fast so that I can get a couple examples in, but, um, Take the time and read the table and read the preamble before the table so that you that you get to know what some of those checkoffs are that are necessary before diving in and making the sort of nutrient content claims that you might want to do on your product. Again, this is really, really useful. It's 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 complicated, but it's extremely useful, and you want to be able to know when your product is compliant. And something else that uh, a lot of food product developers do, uh, they'll often go out and check that their competition is compliant. If their competition is not compliant, oftentimes, what, what back when I worked at the CFIA, a lot of the customer complaints that we got weren't actually customer complaints. They were actually companies ratting each other out because they had claims that were not legitimate on their products. And it was a bit of a bugger, but we had to investigate those claims anyways because yeah, in many cases, the companies indeed were not compliant on their labeling. So make sure if you're designing a product that is compliant and that just takes some research. It takes some patience and it, uh, it takes a good nutrition facts table to back it up, too. All right. Uh, that's it for me. I'm losing my voice because I've made so many videos. Um, ask questions. I will hopefully still have a voice to answer. I will always answer by email. I still have hands to type. So Take care and we will talk to you again real soon.